We had planned to meet in Paris as an early recordings research team in March, which La Nouvelle Athene had kindly organized for us. And like most musicians, we became victims of the virus scare in March when all the traveling had to cease and um, all the concerts were canceled. And this happened just literally a day or two before we were supposed to meet in Paris. Sebastian and I were going to play the first Brahms sonata and obviously we had already prepared our parts. So it was quite a disappointment not to be able to play together. So we looked for solutions uh, to at least do some work together during the lockdown. Our first attempt of a rehearsal over the internet didn't really work so well. I don't think we actually played a single note together. But we didn't give up. And after fixing some of the technical problems, we met again a second time online. And this time, everything worked really smoothly. We heard each other very clearly on the headphones. And it seemed almost like we were in the same room. Almost. We didn't have video. That would have caused too much delay. So there wasn't any visual contact and we couldn't see each other when while we were playing. But I guess that's just like in the old days of gramophone recordings when the musicians also had no way of seeing each other. There isn't a sound recording of this sonata with Johannes Brahms or Josef Joachim. Not even with anyone who might have performed it with or in the presence of the composer. In fact, the earliest gramophone recordings of this sonata date from the 1930s. The one recording that might actually still carry on performance traditions typical for Brahms and his circle the most was made even later, in 1952, more than 50 years after Brahms' death. It was recorded by the violinist Albert Spaulding, accompanied by the Hungarian pianist Ernst von Dohnanyi. Dohnani was appointed as a professor for piano to the Hochschule in Berlin by Josef Joachim himself, and they both performed together frequently. Although Dohnani was 46 years younger than Joachim, and certainly had a very different personality and temper, he must have known very well how Joachim wanted to be accompanied. And in his solo recordings, we have the chance to compare how Dohnani performed the same pieces when recording them for piano roles in around 1906, while teaching at Berlin, and again some 50 years later when he was teaching in the United States. His interpretations are remarkably similar, and there are probably few other artists from the late 19th century who changed their style of performance that little. For string players, um, annotated editions or instructive editions, as we like to call them, can tell us quite a lot about an actual interpretation. And some of the editors of the early editions of the sonatas had direct links to Brahms or Josef Joachim, like Leopold Auer, and especially Franz Kneisel. And Kneisel was very good friends with Brahms, and they played together many times, almost certainly also the G major sonata. So perhaps Kneisel is, is a good guide also because he remained quite conservative and old-fashioned and never modernized his aesthetics as much um, as, for instance, Leopold Auer. Kneiser's fingerings and bowings feel very natural to the music and the implied portamenti are all very tasteful and appropriate. So I guess this is probably as close as any addition to what Brahms might have imagined. From his fingerings, it is quite clear where Kneisel implied the, the Portamenti. But Kneisel never exaggerates, and his fingerings are always simple and straightforward, favoring natural ease and lower positions most of the time, rather than indulging in the sound of the, the lower string so often done in Brahms, and um, which we know Joachim also didn't favor much. There are also a number of indications for harmonics and open strings, which prevent a continuous vibrato. The instructive edition of Kneisel and Bauer also gives us some tempo indications as metronome numbers, 
not just for the beginning of the movement, but also in many other places. For a 21st century musician's eye, the frequent changes in tempo might seem extreme at first, and they certainly don't fit very well with the modern idea of unity of tempo. But I believe we need to learn to appreciate that from a late 19th century perspective, these tempo changes were moderate in comparison with what people were used to hear, especially from those musicians who followed more in the footsteps of Wagner, Liszt and Hans von Bülow. The proponents of the Schumann Brahms circle, for example, the pupils of Clara Schumann or the Gewandhauskapellmeister in Leipzig, Karl Reinecke, all emphasized in their teachings that changes in tempo should be used with caution and restraint. That these warnings did by no means imply that they, they were advocating for a strict adherence to a metronomic tempo becomes apparent when we listen to their recordings. After experimenting a lot with tempo modifications, as we can hear them in historical recordings, we recognized that from some point on, many of these fluctuations in speed no longer feel like changes in tempo at all. Rather, they can be perceived as merely giving in to slight variations in energy, tension or direction laid out in the score, all within a more or less unchanged pulse. The real challenge then becomes to tell apart this constant ebbing up and down in tempo from instances where a real perceivable tempo change is intended. Here the metronome markings in the instructive editions can provide valuable insights. Another very detailed source for the performance of the sonata is an analysis by Donald Tovey. Tovey was perhaps Josef Joachim's closest musical collaborator after Brahms had passed away. And he played the sonata many times with Josef Joachim's. And in fact, the very first time they performed together publicly, they started with this piece. Joachim used to say that he could talk with anyone about music except with Tovey, who he said knows too much. And Tovey wrote some of the most detailed descriptions of Joachim's performances, which he admired greatly. Tovey, with his witty tongue, tells us valuable details of how Joachim understood the sonata. And for instance, about the pizzicato passage, Tovey writes that Brahms did not anticipate a time when violinists who would harp this passage like angels if they thought it part of a popular piece of musical cookery could think that classical chastity compelled them to tighten these chords into dry clicks while the pianist in a burst of noble manliness without sentiment uses six times the tone that Brahms requires for his ethereal melody over its distant bass. And about the, the development section, Donald Tovey writes that it is the only stormy passage in the whole work and that room is made for its crowded incidents by slackening the tempo, più sostenuto, so that the poco a poco tempo primo, which leads to the return, is a slight accelerando, a point not always understood by good players without special experience in Brahms. Unfortunately, although it was the first piece he ever performed publicly together with Joachim, Tovey did not record the Brahms Sonata. But at least he recorded another violin sonata, the G major sonata opus 96 by Beethoven, together with Adila Fakiri, who was in fact the grand niece of Joachim. This recording demonstrates in an exemplary way another typical trait of 19th century performing practice, that for the 19th century musician, nuances in the rhythmic executions and subtle deviation from the printed note values were a sophisticated quality of performance, which was learned and practiced so that an experienced performer had plenty of variants at his disposal, satisfying the demand that a tasteful artist should never play a repeating passage or motif the same twice. 
As a happy coincidence, Spalding and Dohnani also recorded the same Beethoven sonata, which provides us with the chance to compare the two pianists whom Joachim appreciated the most in his final years. Considering that Tovi also spoke of Dohnani only with the highest praise, it is not surprising that we find the same amount of rhythmic alterations in his playing, sometimes almost identical to what Tovi does, sometimes completely different, but still conveying the same spirit of playful variation. This observation makes Dohnani's recording of the Brahms sonata even more valuable. Brahms was very close friends with Josef Joachim and he asked him for advice whenever he wrote for the violin. The Violin Concerto, Opus 77, which Brahms composed at the same time as the, the G major sonata, was written in close collaboration with Joachim and Brahms admired Joachim's style of playing. Joachim was famous for the great freedom in his playing, something which was often referred to as das Freispielen. And as one of his students remarked, he was able to free his rhythm from the fetter of the beat. Over the last years, as part of my PhD, I analyzed Joachim's Freispielen to find out exactly how he did it. And Joachim seems to have been able to do this by playing quite flexibly around the beat instead of exactly on it. And he often seems to have compensated for this freedom in advance, so that, that he first slowed down to then allow for a joyous speeding up, or that he first accelerated to make more time for a beautiful turn or an important note. And we can hear him doing this in his few recordings, like especially in the recording of his own Romanza. And there are instances in this recording where he speeds up before he gets to a melodic climax in order to get more time to, to linger melodically without ever disturbing the flow of the piano. From a pianist's point of view, Joachim's recording of his Romance is also fascinating, as it demonstrates convincingly that to allow this kind of Freispielen, the pianist should not give in to the temptation to follow the soloist too obediently. Rather, he provides the steady and incorruptible pulse that makes it possible to appreciate how free indeed Joachim's playing is. But, of course, this cannot be the only goal in a piece as complex and collaborative as the sonata. Here, the pianist in many places is as much a soloist as the violin player, and therefore bears the same responsibility to shape the tempo in accordance with the energetic developments laid down in the score by the composer. In this regard, Dohnani's recording can be seen as a valuable guide, as in general, while accompanying sections dominated by the violin part, he shows much more restraint for tempo modifications than in his solo recordings, but clearly takes control of the tempo in places where the piano part is more prominent and initiates changes in character. Unfortunately, I couldn't get hold of Joachim's Strat, so I'm using a German instrument from Kassel um, by a maker called Hans Schmidt, which um, Louis Spohr recommended to his students. It has a 19th century setup with gut strings. Um, just the bottom string is wound with silver. And the bow is from the famous Dot Workshop in London, made around 1850. Viennese piano makers kept on their very own tradition until the outbreak of World War I. And although instruments with modern doubled escapement actions and especially the concert grants by Steinway and Sons were omnipresent in concert halls already at the end of the 19th century, famous virtuosos like Theodor Leschetizky and Eugen Dalbert still owned and cherished instruments with the traditional Viennese action. Brahms, too, had such an instrument at his home, built by Johann Baptist Streicher 
in 1868. And he was certainly influenced by the sound of this instrument while composing on it. My Bösendorfer piano dates from 1908. And while it is already cross-strung, it still has the Viennese action with its leather-covered hammers, giving it a recognizable 19th century sound perfectly fitting for the music of Brahms. We weren't even in the same room when we recorded. We weren't even in the same country. So you can tell that not everything is working as well as it could if we were in this in direct contact, breathing the same air. But it was worth the experiment, and it allowed us to concentrate fully on listening to each other, not having any way of communicating visually. Of course, normally, when you play together, even if you are not looking at each other, you still have this direct reaction to body movement, um, even if only in the corner of your eye, by just sensing it. The starting point of our work in the early recordings group of La Nouvelle Latin was the idea to learn the most about 19th century performing practices by imitating historical recordings as closely as possible, doing so-called reenactments in which we attempt to embody even the minutest details of the performance. But this approach was not an option here. Of course we were consulting recordings from which we could take inspirations on how to shape our own interpretation in a 19th century spirit. But there wasn't this one recording that would invite us to do a full reenactment, like with the Joachim Romanze, where we have the composer, who happened to be one of the most admired performers of his time, to play his own composition. Instead, we tried to imagine how the movement might have sounded if someone like Joachim or Franz Kneisel had played it together with Brahms, or, or perhaps better if those musicians had given us a lesson and had told us just a few things, how they would have done this passage or that, and how they understood the work. And in the end, I think we have to accept that there is not one right way to perform this music, and Brahms would probably never have imagined two performances of his works to sound exactly the same. 